Welcome to New Atlas Live. I'm Brian Berletic. Joining me as always is Angelo Giuliano. I want to thank everyone for joining us uh, this Friday evening, at least that it's Friday evening here in Bangkok and also there in Hong Kong. Angelo, how are you? Great, great uh, from Hong Kong. Uh, it seems like uh, lots of things are happening, uh, not in Russia. You know, we, we were expecting Russia to collapse. They told you, they told us, uh, it's not going to last. There's going to be regime change. I see that uh, things are happening in France. You know, the uh, Macron's regime collapsing. We see banks in trouble. Credit Suisse. Now there are talks about uh, uh, Deutsche Bank. So it's exactly the opposite happening. You know, they were expecting. They wanted uh, Russia to collapse, and we we see that there's uh, lots of troubles ahead for the collective West. Well, uh, well, we. We have a lot of things that we want to talk about. Why not? Why not just elaborate on that a little bit? What, what is going on with uh, the bank in Germany, uh, and is it connected to the sanctions, to the the increasing energy price, and the the fact that this increase in energy price is al almost certainly indefinite because the U.S. destroyed the Nord Stream pipelines. And that is not a problem that's going to be fixed anytime soon. So this this most certainly had to impact business in Germany, and then most certainly had a, to impact finance in Germany. What what else can you tell us about that, Angelo? Uh, about Deutsche Bank, uh, I think it's about the notation. It's the the risk. You know, the the price of insurance uh, against bankruptcy, against default, has increased. So let's advance the indicator that uh, Deutsche Bank is in trouble. Now, if you follow the, the stock, it dropped of 15% today. But it seems like the, uh, what we saw with Credit Suisse and uh, uh, the banks that collapsed in the US, uh, those are advanced indicators. We we are going to see probably more banks to follow. So it's, uh, it's quite worrying. And then the situation in France, I've noticed that these protests have uh, been kind of getting out of control. I know that people in France protest pretty often, this seems to be a little more a little more extreme than usual. Uh, are, are you following that, Angela? And what can you tell us about that? Yes, yes. Well, this is probably a continuation of uh, the yellow vest. The yellow vest has been lasting for a long time. There was COVID. There was a stop during the COVID. But this, you know, you have the the core, which is yellow vest. Now you have these pension funds re reforms, uh, which is actually it's it's actually dictated by the EU. It's not Macron just you wake up one day and say, I want to do reforms of pensions. This is dictated by the EU. So they want to uh, increase the age of pensions of two years. Uh, now, uh, there's a, a, the assembly, they couldn't get the vote of support. So is go is going to bypass that. And this is what we call the 49.3, which is actually executive orders. Uh, and he has done dozens of ex executive orders since he's in power. Uh, so he's abusing of his power, and now you have actually a uh, uh, much bigger support. It used to be the yellow vest, now you have a majority of people that are going to the street. And I think it's, it goes beyond just the pension reforms. This is about restoring democracy, because what we have here under this, this regime, it's, uh, it's uh, 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 distorted democracy, the same as you have in the U.S., uh, uh, politicians are not obeying to who votes for them, but then now they are obeying to who funds them. And there's always a difference between what they tell you before being elected and what they, they do once they are elected. And it's interesting because uh, I, I don't know about how people in France feel about their parliament, their elected representatives, whether they actually represent the people or not. But it looks like in France, they're not even going along with that illusion. They're just bypassing that and signing things into being through these executive orders. Uh, and, and it's like in the United States where people also feel that even though they elected these people and they just like you said, they told them they were going to do this or that during the campaign season, as soon as they get into office, they serve um, moneyed interests. And this this is a, I would say a cycle that is just going to continue repeating itself. And and in the process of spinning like this, it's actually digging the, the hole for the West. 
uh, more and more each year. And it, it just seems like one bad decision is leading into another. And I think uh, one of the worst decisions that the West has made recently is this uh, going to proxy war with Russia in Ukraine. Now, a lot of people are, are asking me, uh, you know, in emails and messenger about this depleted uranium going to uh, Ukraine. So let's just take a look at, let's see if I can do this. Yes. Uh, so this is a BBC article. I'm going to use the BBC article to dismantle this claim that uh, there's no big deal about sending depleted uranium to Ukraine. So this is the BBC, British state media, Ukraine war, UK defense sending depleted uranium shells after Putin warning. And what, what the British government's doing is uh, a, li a little clever, but but not really. And what they say is, uh, they're saying this is a very common component. Uh, it's a standard component and it has nothing to do with nuclear weapons, which is kind of true. Depleted uranium rounds are just metal rounds made out of depleted uranium. It is a very dense metal. The problem with depleted uranium is that number one, it is radioactive, but they're saying uh, elsewhere here that that's not even really the issue. The other problem with it is it is toxic, highly toxic. And so in the first couple of paragraphs, the BBC article is citing British uh, a government officials saying that it's not a big deal. Russia is just spreading propaganda about how dangerous it is. And then down here, this is what the BBC says. It says a 2022 UN Environment Program report said depleted uranium was an environmental concern in Ukraine. Depleted uranium and toxic substances in common explosives can cause skin irritation, kidney failure, and increase the risk of cancer. The chemical toxicity of depleted uranium is considered a more significant issue than the possible impacts of its radioactivity. So the UK is trying to dismiss all concerns about depleted uranium by saying it is not a nuclear weapon and it's not the radiation that's the problem. What they're omitting is the fact that the metal, when it when it turns into dust, when it impacts the target, it becomes highly toxic. It causes birth defects, it causes cancer, it causes all kinds of other health problems. And what is all of this for? What is all of this for? It's for these 14 Challenger 2 tanks that the British are sending Ukraine. now. I've talked about this in the past. The Challenger 2 tank has a special gun. It's a rifled gun. That means all the ammunition that the rest of NATO uses for their smoothbore guns does not work. And what I think has happened here is not really that the British think, oh, depleted uranium rounds. This is this will be really good. This will help Ukraine out a lot. I think it's really all they have on hand. They're talking about a Challenger 3 tank, which will actually have a smoothbore gun that will be in common with other NATO tanks. And so they've got this ammunition left over. They're not going to make any more of it in large amounts. So they have whatever they have on hand. That is what they're dumping into Ukraine, even though it's highly toxic. Uh, Angela, what are your what are your thoughts about this? You depleted uranium is nothing new, and we've seen the impact that has had in other places that it's been used. Angelo, well, I think it's uh, in terms of optics for Russia from the Russian side. It's just uh, another. Another insult. I don't think there's going to be a big impact, as you mentioned. We are talking about only 14 tanks, but just uh, just uh, the terms in terms of impact. And so we are they are fighting on farmland. That farmland. What is going to be the impact long term? Because you have this depleted uranium. Uh, in addition to that, you have also this optic of uh, of uh, having Putin to be charged by the ICC. Uh, it's just just completely absurd. It's like it's like they they don't have any more weapons to throw, you know. And they and and those are just uh, and there's an escalation. Uh, or every time you have a news coming out of escalation, depleted uranium. It's a small thing for only 14 tanks, but it's an escalation. Next would be the flood, you know, the fighter jets, and then uh, troops on the ground, and the escalation. It's like every time a new red line a new red line and and it's a vicious circle yes and it really is i think born out of desperation sending these depleted uranium tank rounds and, and another thing for people to consider is that we have not seen a lot of tank on tank fighting in ukraine and these depleted uranium rounds are meant for hitting the uh, piercing through the armor of other tanks but this is just simply something that's not happening 
Uh, most tanks are being destroyed by artillery and anti-tank weapons, like anti-tank guided missiles, which work on a completely different principle. So what? why would they be sending this? It's, it's not going to make any difference at all. I think it's really because they're desperate, they're out of ammunition, the, their stockpiles have been depleted over many years just through neglect and corruption. And uh, it's just one more uh, ridiculous uh, thing that just kind of disrupts the narrative that they're trying to, to put forward, that they care about Ukraine. No, they don't care about Ukraine. They just care about keeping this proxy war going, even if it means uh, polluting the country they claim that they're trying to help with depleted uranium. Uh, let's see, what what else? Oh, I, uh, Angela, have you heard these rumors? And they are just rumors at this point. Uh, France is talking about possibly sending these Mirage uh, fighter jets, very old jets. They are planning on sending them to Ukraine along with these, these MiG-29s that they'll be sending piecemeal to Ukraine. Have you heard anything about that? <laughs> well, those are old. I just, uh, I mean, they might have to take them from museums, but, you know, they're, they're not, I, I didn't even know they were in use still, you know. Uh, I think it's about just recycling. It's a, they, they don't know what to do with those those fighter jets. They're going to maybe send them, but, you know, just just going to be another another money laundering scheme, you know, but it, there's not going to be any impact. I think it's about just uh, very symbolic, giving the impression that they are still sending a lot, but when you... You, and like you do a lot in your shows, it's just you, you go through the figures, you know, quantitative and qualitative. Here, there is no jump in terms of quali quality and neither quantity. It's just uh, less and, and and the quality is not there. Plus, plus all the problematic that comes with it. We are talking about how do you maintain this? How do you maintain this? That's impossible. You know, we are talking, you know, there would be more of a problem than anything, and then they won't. I, I, I doubt that you'll see Mirage on the front. And, and who's going to manage them? Are you going to train Ukrainians to manage your those those fighter jets? That, that's that's absurd. Yeah, I mean that's a good point that you don't see the Western media ever bring up. It's not that you just train some Ukrainian pilots how to fly the jet, and then they just take the jet themselves and they go operate it in in Ukraine. It's not like that. It takes a whole army of people to maintain these jets from uh, on the ground. The pilot flies them, they come back, and that army of people on the ground have to go over it mechanically. They have to be the people who arm it. And and also, what airfields are they going to be taking off from that, that aren't going to immediately be hit by Russian cruise missiles? Uh, so this is a, a reoccurring theme. Now, uh, this, this New Atlas Live will be taking questions the entire time. So if you have a question, uh, just write capital Q or question in all caps, and then write your question, and uh, we'll try to get to it. Um, uh, I, I just want to go over one other thing. I, I think I'm going to make a whole video out of this, but um, I was talking about uh, the Jamestown Foundation, and they were talking about Russian shell production. As a matter of fact, I'll just put the, the article up right here. And uh, Alexander Mikuris of the Duran, he did a he did a follow up video after seeing this this article, and he criticized their methodology. And I I absolutely agree with him. Th this methodology uses very old data points from say 2005 when the Russian economy was was completely different than it than it has been more recently, and so these numbers are almost certainly much higher than they estimate here in this this paper. But if you look at the number of artillery shells being produced every single year from 2014 onward, almost the entire time they've been outproducing the United States. The United States was producing about 15,000 shells a month, which is about 180,000 shells a year. And you can see even these estimates using this flawed methodology shows you that Russia has been making many times more uh, this entire time. And then I heard... Uh, I heard uh, Dmitry Medvedev, and he was talking about Russia making 1,500 tanks, modernized, modern, he says modern tanks every year. And I don't, I don't think that that's too hard to believe because uh, before he announced this, I, you have to remember, we're one year into the special military operation. You had, now this is Novoya Gazeta, anti-Russian, pro-Western. I'm pretty sure it's funded by the US government. And they were talking about in this article, 
using older data points, Russia was making between 200 and 250 brand new tanks plus 600 modernized tanks. And what, what they mean is you have the T-90M. This is the latest main battle tank Russia is operating. Uh, and then they take a T-72 and they bring it up to that standard by replacing the gun, the engine, the fire the fire control systems, the computers and, and sensors and optics. And so that's what they've been doing. So that, already at this point, it's 850. So it doesn't really seem like a big jump to 1,500 considering how serious Russia has been about this. Uh, and you can see even this Jamestown Foundation paper, however flawed it might be, you could see every single year they're increasing production. And so there's no reason to doubt that they didn't increase production for tanks. So this uh, idea that Russia is running out of everything and the West is going to somehow outlast them. And these stories about sending Mirage fighters, these old fighters and uh, Leopard 2s and Leopard 1s, and now they're talking about old M1 Abrams tanks. Uh, it is, Angelo, it's just them trying to give the illusion of constant and increasing support when it's exactly the opposite. Uh, I'm going to look for some questions. Angela, do you have anything you want to add? To that, uh, I think uh, I, I'd like to compare uh, both, like uh, Russia and China. Russia and China, they are actually they have been preparing for one type of fight, you know, and those are on the two cases, those are defensive fight. Uh, the collective West has been uh, uh, preparing for many different types of fights, you know, on different grounds. On in Africa, you see, for example, uh, France is more like prepared to. To do something in Africa, light vehicles, you know. But now, uh, while while when you see uh, China and Russia both have been on on preparing for defensive fight and, and and very specific, that's what they've been preparing for decades. Uh, so so here, uh, when you look at the sourcing, the 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 in terms of uh, uh, tanks, artillery, and so on, well, it's because Russia has been prepared for that. There, there's no, you know, you, I think this spread, you know, the collective West and especially the US has been spreading too much. A large Navy, you want to have 800 bases around the world, you want to have the best fighter jet, you put one trillion, one trillion to develop the best fighter jet, uh, you know, just spreading too much. China, China and Russia, they've been fighting, they've been actually focusing on one thing, China defending itself you know, getting back Taiwan and Russia defending its uh, its border, its border with, with Ukraine. Yes. And I, I think a lot of people don't understand that. Unlike in the movies, it takes years to prepare for a specific type of battle. I mean, even even back in the, the 1990s, when the U.S. went in to Iraq doing uh, Desert Storm, they had a huge military built up over the Cold War. And they still spent about a year preparing for that specific operation. And it was such a mismatch. And uh, a lot of people looking back on it now said that if the Iraqis had been better organized and trained, it probably wouldn't have gone as well as, as it did for the US. And uh, people trying to compare this current uh, conflict in Ukraine with Desert Storm or the 2003 invasion of Iraq, it, it's, you're comparing apples and oranges. There is just no no comparison here's here's a question why are 50 plus western uh nations d deliberately disarming themselves by sending everything to ukraine uh i think that it's desperation they they had this idea in their head that they were going to uh, reassert this unipolar world order encircle and contain both russia and china and they've run out of time and now they're throwing everything that they have left because if they fail now you will have a re-emergent Russia and a growing China that surpasses the collective West. Uh, Angela, why do you think they're doing it? Well, yes, I think uh, there's a lot of optics. They, they want to feel well in the sense that, uh, you know, let's say, what if Ukraine collapses? Uh, they want to be able to, to say, well, we did send you fighter jets. At the end of the day, you, you lost. But they want to be able to say, well, we, we backed you. But... You know, when you look at what, what they they are sending these days, it's not. This is just symbolic, just symbolic. I have a, I have a, I have one thing I would say that I'd like to ask you. Uh, when you're looking at the old increase of spending 
uh, not the short term, but the long term, what it, it is going to do, like uh, we are talking about uh, uh, Poland increasing to 4% of GDP. We are talking about a project by Germany of 100 billion euro uh, over decades. We are talking about uh, Japan increasing, uh, doubling its military spending. What do you think it's, uh, is it going to balance, you know, are they going to take over, um, you know, over the long term? I mean, we know that the short term, you know, uh, Russia is winning, uh, but when I look at all those massive military spendings, we are, we are talking about the increases over a decade, uh, one decade of trillions of dollars. What do you think uh, it's, it's going to be the impact? Uh, I think that's a good question. Uh, if you just look at, say, Poland, this huge military buildup that they announced, they've got all these contracts, all different contracts. It'll take years to fulfill them all. But when they are finally done building this, this Polish military up, and this is a huge, I mean, that, this is money that they just don't have. They don't have this money, and they're going to, they're going to divert it from other things that they absolutely need for their, for their society, for their, their country. It's, it's a, a miniature version of what the U.S. has done with its military spending at the expense of, of infrastructure and social programs. But at the end of the day, they're going to have a military that was roughly the size of Ukraine's military at the beginning of the, the special military operation. It's not going to be bigger than the Russian military. Uh, and it's it's not going to really have capabilities that Ukraine didn't have or, or doesn't have. And so by, by the time they're done doing that, I believe... Uh, Russia and China will already have uh, reached a, a much higher point. Uh, and then we have to just think about it. It all goes down to the fundamentals. Uh, economically speaking, for Russia and China, they, they have much better prospects than the U.S. and the EU. Who uh, And the EU is especially because of what they've done to their energy prices. That is going to be something that impacts absolutely everything else in their economy, including their attempt to build up their military. So, so this is something that they're going to be trying to build up uh, while everything else is falling apart. And at the and it's going to be at the expense of trying to address these other problems that are developing because of their own decision to put sanctions on Russia. So uh, I don't think that this is going to have an impact on fighting between, you know, this proxy war between the US and Russia. I don't, I really don't think that it's going to. Uh, and in the long term, I think it's just going to accelerates the, the collapse, the decay and the collapse of the West. So what what do you think, Angela? Have you, have you thought about yeah, that at all? Yes, I, I think that I saw one, once, uh, you know, a, a parody, an article just making joke of what the U.S. is doing. Uh, the article was, uh, if I remember well, the CIA has unveiled uh, China's plan, secret plan to watch, uh, to wait and watch the collective West to to collapse. Uh, I think I think they're buying time. I think somehow, you know, you, we saw the meeting of Putin and Xi Jinping, and they are waiting slowly for the collapse. Things are going to happen that are actually going to go against this long-term plan to fight Russia and China, uh, either first Russia and, or China, or create two fronts. Um, I think they, they feel confident that the collective West might collapse before that. Just imagine we see France. I mean, we, we, we already knew that uh, we'd see riots. Regime change, we've talked about this. Regime changes, you know, all those governments, they backed Ukraine, they have problems at home. There's a lot, lots of fundamentals which are also related to the this printing of uh, paper toilet currency, you know, which is based on nothing. Now you have you, you have the world which is uh, going towards de dollarization They're finding other alternatives. They're really tired of all those regime change. You know the interference. You know the aggressiveness. And you see so many. How many friends the U.S. has lost recently? You know they either lose their friends or they make new enemies. You know we can we can see one by one. You know like uh, Saudi Arabia. What happened? You know it was in a matter of two years. Uh, and, and so many more. Turkey, you know, we had, we see Hungary, uh, little by little, you know. And and I think the opportunity maybe to avoid war is to have the collective West to collapse. I mean, sadly, you know, sadly. But if I if I had to choose between my wishes of uh, World War Three of the co or the collective West collapsing, you know, maybe maybe I think 
I think, you know, it's interesting because the U.S. has been uh, uh, exporting those color revolution regime change, you know, because they wanted to bring democracy. Well, why don't we start bringing democracy in the collective West? Real democracy. Democracy is democratos, power to the people. You know, they're waking up in France. They know, I mean, this is not democracy, you know, this is a, this is a democracy by the 1%, for the 1% of the 1%. That's, that's all around, you know, EU is, it's, you know, it's not, it's not a democracy. That's all around the collective West, such an hypocrisy. And they wanted to export that system to the global South, to other countries, you know, with doing and doing interference over and over. You know, maybe, maybe they're getting a taste of their own medicine now. Yes. Um, do you think that Macron will resign? And even if he does, what difference will that make? Because I, I think just like in the United States or in the UK, they have essentially a deep state that is run by special interests and probably not even not even primarily by French special interests. Uh, they'll just get somebody else in. They'll, they'll try to kick the can down the road. Uh, how, exactly. how, do you think that'll, how do you think that'll play out, Angela? There's going to be always a replacement. You know, it's uh, you know, you do the, you know, we, we needed you for this task. You know, it's going to be recycled. Uh, you know, Macron. Don't I mean? Remember, he comes from the bank Rothschild. You know, uh, there's going to be. You know, now is a it is a revolving door. He's going to have a high paid job. Either it's going to be in the system. You know, it could be uh, NATO. It could be in the EU. You know, having discussion. You know, this this gold golden position. You know, golden parachute, or just going back to banking. You know, but uh, ultimately, he was never working for France. He was working for the you know the the globalist elites. You know, the imperialistic project. Uh, so, so this is what they have in common. You see, um, they. When you elect a president, he's supposed to put a priority on his country. You know, this is actually, I, I would respect any ideology. I do not care. It could be right, left, whatever. For me, what is important is to you, when I see a president, an elected official, you know, a leader, I ask myself the question, is he working? Is he working for his own people? And is he, is he delivering? That's the main question. Now you see most leaders in the EU, and in the US, they're not working for people. They're not. You know, I, I don't have a, a, actually not a democracy. I mean, uh, uh, you know, a, a tough regime, but which is working for the people rather than having a democracy, which is a completely fake one, which is working for, for the elites. You know, Macron, if you really follow how Macron was elected, I did follow, it was so, you know, there's a very strong correlation between how much exposure you get into the media and how much percentage of votes you, you get. So he was constructed, you know, he, he, they constructed, the same as they did with the Obama. You see how they constructed the figure of Obama. You know, he was all, in all the medias. Actually, the media had selected him before the people even know about him. So you could see, you know, that there are nine families in France that own the media, nine very rich families. They actually had a concerted effort you know, before this first election, you know, and he was in all the magazines, you know, like all, you know, the cool, cool pictures between with him and his wife, you know, uh, and, and and of course, when you have 50% of exposure, well, you get 50% of the vote. That's how it works, you know, if it's just about giving an, an illusion to people that they, they selected him they, uh, and they chose him. No, no, no. There's a two process. First step is selection. The selections, that's the most important. After we give you two choices, but you know, those are pre-selected choices for us. You know, so so it's important. So it's important to see to ask to to when you see a president, you know, like first thing, I mean is he working for his own people? That's the most yeah, important. I, yeah, and I, I think uh far too many people get caught up in this uh, this charade, basically. It's like pro wrestling. Uh, you have one guy writing the, the script or there's a team of writers writing the script and people pick their sides, but ultimately both sides are working for the, the same people that the script writers are working for. It, it's, a, it's a story. It's a, it's a narrative that is artificial. And far too many people, even in, at, at this point, 2023, far too many people across the West are paying into this illusion 
I see everyone in the U.S. getting ready, uh, you know, this side or that side. And when you really look at their, say, their foreign policy alone, they're almost like that. Like their foreign policy is almost identical. And if someone is saying, well, we, you know, this this conflict in Ukraine is a bad idea, and people are like, yes, I agree with that. But then they continue, their sentence continues. It's a bad idea because we need to be getting ready for war with China. So it's it's actually worse when you really think about it. They wanna they wanna stop Ukraine because they wanna accelerate the war with China. And at the end of the day, they'll get you either supporting the war in Ukraine or supporting a war with China, or if they can manage it, get you to support both. But as long as you're propping up one part of the agenda, you're helping move the whole thing along. And I just wish people would kind of wake up and uh, see that. Now, Angela, you said about things changing and things in the Middle East are changing. Now, I saw this question. The U.S. did a retaliatory strike in Syria. Uh, how do you see that ramping up? I, that, that is a good question. Uh, the problem is the United States is now isolated in Syria. All of their so so-called allies, I call them hostages. I think, Angela, you, you're the one that started referring to them as, as hostages. Uh, they see an exit and they are taking it. They're working with China. They're uh, repairing their ties with each other, uh, Saudi Arabia with Iran, now Saudi Arabia with Syria. The proxy war is winding down to an end. And the U.S. has troops there just in, in the middle of uh, eastern Syria, stealing oil, squatting on their, their best farmland, and they're surrounded. And, uh, you know, they're not the only ones with proxies. Other proxies are taking shots at these illegal U.S. military bases there. And now the U.S. is trying to prove that, well, if you do that, you'll pay a price. But, it, but people understand that there's a, an end coming for all of this. And they're going to be very careful about how they retaliate, but will the West, will the United States, will they will they do something uh, drastic or extreme? Angela, how do you, how do you see it ramping up? Um, I don't see it ramping up. I mean, uh, they they could have had uh, Russia could have a direct confrontation if it wanted uh, against the U.S. They 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 tried they they, they didn't want that. Uh, I think they still want to buy time. Russia, China want to buy time. They want to avoid direct confrontation. Uh, you know, it, it, because because no nobody wins there. They still too much to lose. Uh, they're on the right side of history. They see that the the collective the the, the global south is backing this new project. New projects. There are plenty of new projects around the world. You know, we have BRICS, we have the Belt and Road Initiative. There are many. You know, and they're working actually twenty four seven. You know, to create this new currency. And see who's backing, who's behind that. You know, we are talking about slowly 80% of the world's population. You know, the latest country, just Mexico, think about one thing. I mean, Mexico, you know, having an interest in joining BRICS, that's a neighbor of the US. You know, and you have the president saying, I mean, face to face, he's saying, well, you know, we, we do not agree about this imperialistic agenda you know things that were unthinkable yesterday are becoming a reality and i think i think more countries are be going to be uh, emboldened by that you know i i think uh, we we need to look uh, carefully you know what what would be the first uh, country from the collective west which could be shifting you know but we see um coming from switzerland you, you see I, i've been digging a little bit of one you know about uh, switzerland position on the sanctions on russia and so on well, you know what we we were forced you know switzerland was forced you know i i started blaming my country at the beginning you know I, you know people ask i'm half swiss half italian but but switzerland you know the the actually the the banking lobby they went to the the parliament and uh, you know and, and they started doing lobbying because it was uh, they could have sanctions by by uh, U.S. banks, you know, because you know they could threaten the whole banking industry. They had no choice. So you see, uh, how many are really allies? The the Switzerland is follow, falling because it doesn't have any choice. But the day it has choice, then things might change. Yes, uh, a really good point, and a lot of people have to keep that in mind. There are a lot of countries. Um, even countries that aren't really even considered allies of, of the West, but they, uh, you know, they'll go along with, say, a UN vote because it's just not worth it, the, the amount of pressure and the attention that you'll attract to yourself. Everyone is 
everyone is well aware of how dangerous the U.S. is, and they want to keep their heads down, and they kind of want to run out the clock. That I think there's a lot of a lot of that going on. So the situation in Syria, I believe that uh, Syria, Iran, they have their proxies. They will use them to keep the pressure on on the U.S. But they don't want it to escalate into a war. And I don't think that the U.S. really wants to escalate it into a war. So there's going to be this careful balancing act of keeping pressure up on the U.S. to keep the cost high for them maintaining their occupation there so that they'll eventually leave, uh, but without escalating towards a, a, a conflict in that region. So I don't think the U.S. Can, can afford that. They've got way too much going on right now. Uh, there's two questions here. Uh, it's back to Ukraine. Uh, will the Ukrainian offensive be the last throw of the dice? And uh, and when they are defeated with Bakhmut, it'll be over. No, I don't think that it'll be over. But we're we're moving towards a, a point where Ukraine is going to exhaust this essentially an army's worth of trained manpower and equipment that the the West has transferred to them again. And once that is gone, the West does not have the ability to do that again. So we're going to come to a, a, an eventual point where their fighting capacity collapses, but it's not going to happen suddenly. It's going to happen gradually. And I think we already see that. They're getting ready for this big offensive where, I don't know where, because uh, we got this question here. Uh, there's rumors that Ukraine has 80,000 soldiers and they're getting ready for a counteroffensive in, in Bakhmut. Uh, how, so how, how is Ukraine even able to do this? And should Russia start doing the same? Well, I, I have something, it. Brian. Uh, military, uh, I just saw a video of military sum summary. Uh, Dima Dima claims that there are 80,000 groups, and uh, that could be the, I mean, the last try, you know, just throwing the dice, you know, double up. Um, you know, I, I that that's, uh, you know, uh, but they they were saying like uh, there was already like fifty sixty thousand uh, some weeks ago, uh, but that that would be, would be just crazy. I mean they they might be able to to take back back mood, but what cost? What cost? I mean do they have do they have the you know the capacity? I mean just in terms of uh, artillery, uh, you know it's just that. And it's interesting how how they they project. You know they say they say Russia is sending waves of. Uh, soldiers. That's exactly what what actually Ukraine is going to do if they do that. If they send eighty thousand troops, yes. And and look, we we don't actually know where Ukraine is going to launch their you know their supposed spring offensive. Russia has made preparations both in the south, Zaporozhia and Kherson, but they've also made extensive preparations in the Donbas region. And so this 80,000, if that is true, if there's 80,000 Ukrainian troops and they're preparing for some sort of a major offensive there, maybe that's where they're going to launch their offensive. We, we just don't know until it happens. One thing I will say, though, is if that is supposed to be a counteroffensive to break the encirclement of Bakhmut, uh, something that large, they're going to be drawing trained manpower and equipment that was supposed to be used or could have been used for their main spring offensive. So they're already diminishing their their combat potential elsewhere by doing this counteroffensive at Bakhmut. They have a, a finite amount of men and, and resources, and they are now starting to divide it up. They have an encirclement in Avdivka, which is one of the most fortified cities Ukraine has in, in the Donbas region. And it's it's been fortified over the course of eight to nine years. And now that is being encircled. And that is, that is a major uh, crisis for Ukraine operationally. Uh, so they're going to be tempted to try to break that or reverse that. And the, the, the problem is they just don't have enough man, trained manpower and heavy weapons to do that. Uh, they're talking about surging like something like a million artillery rounds into Ukraine, but they only have, uh, I think it's like 116 artillery pieces on the battlefield at any given time uh, because they have 300, but a lot of them are down for maintenance because of the, the huge rate of fire they 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 uh, on a day-to-day, week-to-week and month-to-month -month basis. So it's a huge problem that is just going to continue to compound. And as Russia takes out additional guns and destroys additional he heavy equipment, uh, wipes out one one unit after the other, the, the problem will compound further. That the, the West is tapped out. They have nothing else to feed into this proxy war. That that is the problem. 
Uh, Angelo, uh, anything else you want to add to that? I'm going to look for another question here, some more questions. No, no, I just, uh, I, I, I have a question actually for you. There's, uh, there's lots of, uh, they're talking about a lot, a lot about shells, uh, but, and, and we understand that, you know, this, this, this is a, one of the weakest point when it comes to Ukrainian army. How about artillery? Because I mean, there's so much artillery that has been destroyed. The, what, the collective West doesn't have any artillery to send anymore. So. You know, because there's the, the correlation, you know, you might have, you know, might compensate a little bit the shells still not have enough, but, you know, are they going to, have they been compensating when it comes to artillery? Yeah, that is actually a huge problem. The, you know, I, the, the West, in theory, they should have enough artillery pieces, but what, what will happen is they'll send everything that they have. And in some cases, that, that is what they've done. The UK has sent almost all their... Uh, self-propelled artillery pieces to Ukraine. They have nothing left. And France, too, by the way, has sent a huge number of their self-propelled artillery pieces. I think it's called the Caesar. Caesar. And, and so, yes, the, the artillery pieces are also disappearing. They, uh, Ukraine had their own, had over a thousand uh, guns. Uh, they're, they're, they have been whittled away. Now what NATO has said, that has been whittled away. And uh, Russia still has over a thousand and, uh, you know, they have, you know, there's a problem when you're firing artillery pieces, you have a smaller and smaller number of them, and you're feeding more and more rounds through each gun that wears it down faster, and then you've got to send it a thousand kilometers to Poland to get uh, refitted and then set back another thousand kilometers. Again, this is a an accumulative problem that's building up for Ukraine. And this is what people have been saying about uh, logistics, the fact that you Ukraine has to get everything from across the, the border with Pol Poland, get everything from there, and also send everything there to get fixed and, and to come back. This is a huge problem. It's it's not it's, it's not going to it wouldn't have been easy under the most ideal conditions, but these are the least ideal conditions. Uh, here's a related question. What is the reason the Russian military hasn't struck the Western Ukrainian supply lines coming in from the West? Uh, so this is talking about when they have tr trucks coming in with ammunition or guns, first of all, they'll be covered. It won't be obvious what they are. And also they'll be moving. And the only weapons that Russia at this moment can use to target uh, supplies in, in the West of Ukraine would be something like cruise missiles or these uh, Garan-2 drones. And that, that's really just about it. And you're not going to hit a moving target with a, a cruise missile. That would be very difficult. It would also be very expensive. And also, if you're not exactly sure what is on that truck, it's just not worth it. The closer those weapons and ammunition get to the front line, the more options and opportunities that open up for Russia. They have a wider array of weapons, uh, drones that can detect them, and then weapons that can be used to destroy them much, much closer and more efficiently. So that's what they've been doing. Uh, ideally, yes, you would like to hit those supply lines, but that would require Russia flying military aviation over those, those roads like they were doing in Syria. They just can't do that right now because of the, the air defense situation. Ironically, these uh, still formidable Soviet era air defense systems. Uh, a lot of people ask that question, though. I, I get that question a lot. Uh, yes, ju just one thing. Uh, correct me if I'm if I'm mistaken, but uh, the, the the most efficient transportation when it comes to to military uh, equipment is via train. And I think yes. that what Russia did was to to actually trying to destroy the electric uh, infrastructure, so the the train wouldn't move. Because once once you take away from the equation trains, well, it's impossible. I mean. How would you move tanks from from the border uh, from Poland all the way uh, to to southeast uh, Ukraine? Yeah, well, you'd have to put them on flatbed trucks, which is yeah. um, uh, a much a much more difficult prospect. So, yeah, yes, you're absolutely right about that. Uh, what about this one, Angela? What do you think about this? The this this uh, these you know there were these Chinese citizens. I think they were working at a mine. And they were attacked by some rebel group. I'm doing some research into this because uh, Africa is really not my my area of expertise. But I have been covering for many years 
U.S.-backed armed separatists in places like Baluchistan, Pakistan, and also in Myanmar, and also the the U.S.-backed armed, you know, insurrection in Xinjiang, China, and across the border. And that that was the U.S. stirring up these violent organizations and using them to essentially wage a proxy war against China for years and years to target the Belt and Road Initiative, uh, attack the physical infrastructure, and also target the engineers building it, uh, the workers building it, and also the local security protecting it. Uh, Angelo, who do you who do you think might be behind this? I, I think there's not not really enough evidence at the moment to, to no. nail it down. No, but I think. Uh, uh we need to keep in mind when it comes to demonizing china uh, just the us the us alone has a budget of 500 million dollars a year just to uh, do pat publicity uh, on china and specifically on the better known initiative so if there's anything to be done against chinese we might ask the question if those this uh, you know negative coverage on purpose to to depict China, to demonize China, eh, are they are they contributing to to this uh, to what is happening? You know, to 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 this type of action. Uh, when we we saw so similar things, but the, we we can actually be much more precise when it comes to to what happened in Pakistan. Those were uh, deliberate, you know, actions uh, against the better known initiative, and the the was was by the free baluchistan movement which is backed by the us so here that was that was much easier uh here when it comes to africa that's you know that's 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 too difficult but we can we can have an idea it could be it could be you know part yes. of the this proxy war it could be it, it it definitely fits into a very well established pattern it's not as if the united states isn't heavily active in africa behind uh, a multitude of terrorist organizations that they use to terrorize the different countries there and to justify them inviting themselves in to f fight against them just as they were doing in the middle east uh, claiming they were there to fight al-qaeda and isis when in fact they were sponsoring these these terrorist organizations uh, so it, it, it was a very cynical cycle of creating problems and then pretending to to solve them and at the end just establishing a, a military occupation of of multiple countries, that's what they were doing. It's like the the local mafia breaking windshields at night and then opening up a windshield repair shop during the day. Some something along those lines. Uh, but you know, we we should avoid the trap of just assuming we we have to get the evidence. That's yeah. that's what makes uh, the alternative media. That's what should make it different than the Western media. I, I'm looking for some other questions. Uh, how about we talk about? Uh, AUKUS a little bit, Australia, UK, US, it's it's an anti-China alliance and really not even a, an alliance, it's the US and the UK hijacking Australia, transforming them into yet another proxy to, to wage uh, some kind of war against one of Washington's and, and London's enemies, in this case, China. They're getting these nuclear submarines. I wanna show the just the headline. This headline, maybe Angela, you could explain explain what what they're talking about here. It says, "How can Australia pay 368 billion for new submarines? Some of the money will be created from thin air." Does that sound like a sustainable uh, fiscal policy for Australia, especially at a time where we see all these Western banks r running into problems because everyone is overextended and uh, they're not they're, they're not doing anything sensible? Is this Australia following? Angelo. Oh, oh, yeah, yeah. Sorry, sorry, I didn't. Uh, oh, no well, worries. Yes. I, I, I'll, re yes. I'll repeat the question. We, we, we uh, see all of these Western banks uh, collapsing, uh, overextended, uh, playing shell games with their, their finances. It's, it's not a fundamental, solid, sustainable economy. And now we see Australia doing this, buying these submarines. Who are they, who are they buying these submarines to protect themselves against? Uh, I, and uh, as you as you start answering, Angelo, I just want to show people um, this is who Australia exports to, okay? China, and this is who they import from, also China and and mainly uh, Asia. So, claiming that they need these submarines to protect themselves against who their their largest, most important trade partner. 
that doesn't make any sense, Angelo. What, what's actually going on here? I was just making a, a quick calculation. The population of Australia, 25.6 million people. Now, if you put into perspective, this expense of $369 billion, uh, that is uh, 12, 13, around $13,000 per capita. So each person in Australia is contributing by $13,000 each Australian. That's massive in terms of proportion. That is massive. Uh, then uh, when you look at, uh, you know, just the historic, uh, uh, and I want you to repeat, I mean, this is 369 billion, this is the initial bill. You know, over time, we all know that, you know, it can blow up, it can go up to $500 billion, uh, you know. So it is supposed to be in defense, in defense, you know, against against who? Against China, the, the main partner. And then what would China do to Australia? I mean, just think for a second. Do you think that China would go all the way to Australia and invade Australia for what? To do what? It just, it just doesn't make any sense. Um, just historically, by the way, the, the initial project of those submarines was a, they were supposed to buy French uh, diesel propelled submarines, much cheaper, you know, and, and what happens that overnight they broke the agreement and they went for nuclear propelled uh, submarine. Well, my, the big question mark is that, you know, is, is it going to infringe the, the non-nuclear proliferation treaty? I, I think this is the, that's the risk we might have with, the, with Australia, is that, you know, are, the, are those, those submarines being equipped by, by uh, nuclear uh, warhead? Uh, that, that's a big question because this is, that's, they start like this now, but, you know, are we, are we going to nuclearize uh, Australia? Uh, that's that's another question. Yeah, I mean, the, the main reason they want nuclear powered submarines is because of their range and their endurance. And this is not meant to protect Australia by any stretch of the imagination. It's in it's to enable Australia to join the United States right off the coast of China and menace China. That's what it's meant for. It's not it's not in any way meant to defend Australia. That's why Australia was buying diesel electric submarines in the first place is because that is what's actually appropriate for depend, uh, defending Australia. It's, it's a reasonable purchase to have. Nuclear powered submarines, are, again, are only so that Australia could join this, this crusade the US is on to contain, encircle and contain China. That's what this is about. So from the very beginning, at the very starting point of AUKUS, it is aggression toward China. And we, uh, you, 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 uh, and I see people in the comment section mentioning it. Also, the former Prime Minister Paul Keating, he he was at some media event and he had one, and they say there's no such thing as a dumb question, but it was just one dumb question after the other about, oh, why why are you against these nuclear powered submarines? Uh, China's building up their navy. Uh, don't you think that is a a threat to us? And he had he had some really good answers and angela uh, people should follow you on twitter and you posted a, a clip from that event and uh, angelo's twitter information is in the video description below so people can go check that out uh but but why ag again china is a huge nation uh, largest population on earth geographically it is large what why what is wrong with it building up its military angelo you were explaining before the show about uh defense spending as part of the, the GDP and how much money each country is spending on military. Is China spending the most on its military in, in the whole world? Uh, just to give, uh, in terms of, I think that the good calculation is to have a, a per capita. Uh, um, if you, uh, uh, and uh, uh, what is the share of uh, GDP? So when it comes to China, we are talking about 1.7%. The US, it's double. Uh, it's a, and it's quite low, you know. I mean, actually, the threshold, uh, the minimum threshold for NATO, I think, is two percent. So China is actually, it's growing. Uh, the, the, its economy is growing, and its defense spending is growing in proportion. So, to give you an example, that there actually there's lots of things in the media these days. Of uh, they said, well, China is ex is expected to increase by seven percent military spending. Well, you know what? Do you know why? Mm -hmm. Because China's economy is going by six percent, 
So it's going, its defense spending is going in proportion of, of its economy. Uh, and again, it's, a, it's not power projection. You know, that's the question we need to ask. You are going to defend yourself against a power which is projecting its power. You know, an army that is projecting its power. Uh, how many uh, US uh, uh, army bases China has around the world? You know, I, I can count one. You know, there's one in Djibouti, in Africa. But this is like for UN peace, peace forces, you know, like, uh, you, you know, related to African missions. But, but China is not, has not been projecting its force, you know. But then compared to the US, we're talking about uh, 800, 900 US uh, army bases around the world. And that's, that's the way, a huge waste of money too. Just think about, uh, you see, in terms of efficiency, uh, uh, that would be interesting to see how much those eight, 900 uh, US army bases cost around the world. And also, you know, also we need to compare the, 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 the spending, you know, uh, compared to, you know, $1 what it delivers in China, $1 what it delivers in the, in the US, you know, taking into account that there's, you know, power, uh, uh, purchasing power parity adjustment, but additional to that, there's lots of corruption. You know, this, yes. is, you know, and you mentioned this, this is really important to remember that, you know, we have, uh, you know, in, in Russia and China, the, those defense are purpose driven, you know, those military spending are purpose driven, you know, in the collective West, that's a business, it's profit driven, and it's how to enrich the military industrial complex. So there's a lot of waste, lots of waste. Just think about how much Russia is spending in US dollar terms and what the collect NATO is spending. I think it's probably, you know, and Russia is fighting NATO right now. Russia is depleting NATO, uh, NATO forces, you know, that, you know, and, and, and probably uh, Russia, I it might be like, they, they, they might be spending like only 5% of all combined NATO forces are, are, are spending. So there's a lot of waste. And luckily, I mean, it's, luckily, that, that's a good thing, you know, because, because otherwise it would be very hard to match, uh, to match a NATO force uh, if it was for, 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 in the case of Russia. Yeah, and it's, it's a good point because uh, I, we always hear, look at the combined GDP of the U.S. and EU. Uh, Russia's economy is puny. It's wimpy. There's no way it, it can compete. And look how much we spend on our, on our military. But if you look at something like the F-35 and how it's, it's costing over a trillion dollars the entire program, and then you look at uh, com you know similar programs in Russia, it's, it's a fraction because they're not they're not just uh, overpricing everything and trying to maximize profits. It's, it's the state is directing yeah. defense uh, where the defense industry in the U.S. is directing uh, the government. So it's, uh, it's, it's, it's all backwards and it translates into very concrete terms on the battlefield. Angela? Yeah, I just want to compare. I mean, you see how inflated our GDP is. I mean, it's just, it's just ridiculous. And, and I think what happened with Russia was a very good example. Uh, just the one iPhone. When you think about an iPhone, let's say the production cost in China is 50 US dollar. You know, it's assembled. They, 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 and, and they have done the physical product. What happened in, in uh, it comes into the US and it's multiplied by 10 or 20, but it's only packaging and branding. That's in terms of GDP, that's a creation of GDP. In reality, let's say, you know, uh, tomorrow we are at war, uh, this inflated GDP disappears and we come, it comes down to much less services and and, and probably, you know, an, an economy like the U.S. could be maybe uh, uh, one third of the economy of, of China. You know, I think we need to, to look at just manufacturing. China is three times the manufacturing of the U.S., you know, real economies, you know, and, and, and it's all inflated. There's so much inflated. You know, you have uh, too many lawyers, they overpaid, uh, you, know, you know, healthcare, healthcare, which is completely inflated, three times the per GDP, per, per, uh, compared to GDP, three times what China spends, but while China is actually having a, a higher life expectancy, which is meaning that they're delivering more, you know? So it, we need to be extremely careful. Uh, the, the collective West is not as powerful because just, you know, it's it's very much inflated. It's it's made out of nothing. Those are financial, uh, financialized economies. 
you know, it's not about really going back to creating real goods, tangible goods. You know, now, now the U.S. has become no more like producing country. It's a consumer country. They consume now. They consume, but yes. why? And then we have to ask ourselves the question: Why they consume? Because they have what the goal used to call the exorbitant privilege to own the global currency. So, meaning that you can actually indebt yourself as much as you want, you know. And uh, and, and and by and that's by the use of force. You know, it was not. Keep in mind that the dollar was not imposed because the world wanted it to be imposed. No, no, no. It's it's it was imposed by force. You use the dollar. If you if not, well, you are going to end up like Gaddafi, like Saddam Hussein. You know, uh, who, whoever tried. And then what happened? Well, the first one is actually facing the collective West, the U.S. That's Putin. You know, but but he has learned before. He has learned. He saw what happened to to Gaddafi. He saw what happened. You know, Gaddafi wanted to to do to to create a uh, uh, a currency for Africa, a golden back dinar that it would apply to Africa, and he was killed for that. You know, now you have actually big guy like Putin. You know, he has an army to back him up, and he's facing bravely the U.S. And now you have the 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 global South, which is actually watching. And it's like, oh, you know what? It's working now. Gaddafi was crazy, you know, he, he couldn't back up his words. Now you have Putin and everything is getting organized. Now you see what happened every single day, there are things happening. You know, and what, what did Putin and, and, and Xi Jinping say? You know, we what we are doing these days we have, we are, is the big, biggest thing for, for the next hundreds of years. Yeah. This is a I, new I, breath of words. world is changing. Yeah, and I think people can can see that. And I think the I think in Washington and in Brussels and in London they can see that, and they're and they're panicking. And uh, what we were talking about uh, people trying to justify this AUKUS agreement because they claim that China is some some sort of threat to Australia. But we were just talking about how it's the U.S. actually waging proxy war on China already, already killing Chinese people around the world. You, we don't see China doing that anywhere. We don't see China uh, going into anyone else's. They're not militarily occupying some other country anywhere. That uh, The 21st century, that has been something the U.S. and its allies have been doing. Uh, I, I see this question. Uh, how, does, how does China's financing of the Belt and Road Initiative uh, threaten the U.S. financial industry? Well, I, I'll just say that the Belt and Road Initiative shows the world uh, what a, a serious government can do with money and resources and human resources. They can build this infrastructure, they can connect nations together, and they can supercharge the economy, the real economy, without resorting to uh, pyramid schemes. And this threatens the, the US financial system because now the financial system in the US can be compared to something else. Something that is producing tangible results that are improving people's lives around the globe to a uh, essentially a pyramid scheme that I think everyone knows is a pyramid scheme. Uh, Angela, you know more about this than I do. What do you think about that? Well, yes, uh, what happens is that uh, normally uh, China has a surplus. The trade surplus is massive. We are talking about $1 trillion a year. So normally what the U.S. would want China to do would be to, to use a big part of this trade surplus to reinvest into the U.S. debt, so buying U.S. Treasury bonds. Uh, China is not doing that. On the contrary, it is actually investing, recycling its U.S. trade surplus into the Belt and Road Initiative. So this is not going to going to this Ponzi scheme because that's a Ponzi scheme. As, lo as long as you create new debt, you know it's a it's a debt that which is not meant to be repaid. So China is going against that. And every single country that actually stops buying U.S. bonds or start to sell U.S. bonds is going against this Ponzi scheme. So if you really look, even the partner of the U.S., I'm giving you, you know, even Japan, Saudi Arabia, just look at their position in U.S. bonds, and you see it's been declining. Even Switzerland has been has been selling U.S. bonds. So when you cannot have uh, create new debt, which is going to be bought by other countries, what do you do? You start printing money. 
you know, and that's what the U.S. is doing right now, and the, it, it, it's actually contributing to to a decreasing value of dollar, you know, uh, relatively, you know, compare maybe not to the, to the euro, uh, but, but for, from uh, uh, compared to to other other currencies like the ruble, you know, like Brazilian uh, currency, and uh, and. Uh, the, there's another impact. Uh, well, I think I think I lost my train of thought. <laughs> okay. Well, I'm, I mean, I, again, though, yeah, I, I I could just tell you that being here in in Southeast Asia all of these years, uh, when I first came here, this was before China began this this very visible rise, and you could see the state of everything, and this was mainly Western influence over the region at the time. And what they were doing was they were keeping everyone poor. And they had the financial crisis in the 1990s, and uh, that was the IMF. And it was all of this predatory lending that they're now accusing China of. And when you look around, it's like, what, what were all of these loans for? Because you really don't see any major uh, advances. But then ever since China began its rise, you can see the the physical transformation of the region, the the infrastructure projects drive development in and of themselves, and you can see how it's improving everybody's life. And I, uh, Laos is such a stark contrast from when I first saw it to where it is now. They didn't even have highways running through their their country. China came and built highways. They came and they built a high speed railway, and now. Uh, they are able to do things they never could do before. And before China came in and started doing that, the West was already there. Their NGOs were sitting there squatting on Vientiane, the capital. They had their little SUVs going around in the dirt roads in the capital. Uh, I, I always tell the story, hanging up banners, telling the, the Lao people, don't don't turn your lights on. Be happy with no electricity. That's, that's the West's approach, is to keep everybody poor and down in the dumps because then it's easier for... The, the West as a small percentage of the population to hold dominion over everyone. And China's doing the exact opposite. They're building everybody up. They're creating a balance of power. And when you look at that system versus the US system, just its existence alone is a threat to the US system because it is showing you a better alternative that is more appealing to everybody from the top to the bottom of society. And this is what the, the US is up and up against. And Angela, you said it perfectly. They're they're spending how many hundreds of millions of dollars every year to just smear China and to poison people's minds against China uh, because they know how powerful it is what China is doing. So they try to poison people against it. Uh, this is hard, hard to tell. I see it taking root in certain segments of the population, unfortunately. Uh, but I think overall, you can lie. You can lie all day. Uh, when someone wakes up to that lie, they don't they don't ever go back to sleep. And I think that's why what drives uh, you, Angelo. I know it's what, what drives yeah. me. We're at the, the one hour mark. Do you have any uh, closing closing thoughts, Angelo, on, on that or or anything else? Uh, just, just the approach of uh, the, two, the two countries, uh, mainly the US and, and China. You see the US, and, and this is in general, it is a, because of the culture, it's a emotionally driven. You know, people are, you know, it's it's uh, also the the leaders. We we talked about this in our last show. You know, the leaders are are selling you the dream. They're telling you what you want to hear. It needs to be appealing. It needs to be sexy. You know, and when then it comes when it comes to China, we are facing engineers. They're very rational. They're very scientific. They're not going to sell you. I mean, sell you BS. You no, know, it's going to be. This is a five year plan. We are going to deliver. You know, that's boring. You know, that that, that would be boring from from you know the background from someone from the west you know it's it's just uh so you see you see like those two this the, the those these huge gaps between the cultures you know one one which is emotionally driven and one is very not rational and when you look at what is happening in ukraine you see exactly that you see uh, how many decisions the collective west europe has been taken taking and irrationally you know it was just emotionally driven sanctions let's cut swift let's do that i mean every single day there was a new action well you know what russia has done like a chess 
master. They had anticipated all the moves and they had been preparing since 2014 for all those sanctions. They've been prepared. And then what happens is that you've, you've prepared, you, you had 10 moves ahead and you see in front of you someone panicking because he's emotionally driven. He's not scientific. And why those politicians in the EU, EU they were actually wanted to be look sexy in front of their, their audience. So they had to go to Kiev. They had to embrace, oh, give me a hug. Trudeau, give me a hug, Zelensky. Oh, you know, like kiss and hugs and so on. Do you think they are going to play this, this Hollywood game, Xi Jinping and Putin? No, I mean, no, they're adults. They are the adults in the room. You know, they, they work. They do their homework. And it's not going to be sexy. You know what? It's not going to be sexy. It's not going to be like, oh, you, you know, like all those, those posture, you know, all those postures. And, and this is where the big gap is, you know, and, and this is what, what people should, should, should I, I think that maybe, maybe we, well, this is what, what I have, I mean, personally, I've been learning from Asia and, and probably you also in, in Thailand, you know, how, how people are much more rational down to earth. You know, it's, uh, you know, people, they, you, you, you start talking about identity, politics, uh, freedom, and so on. It's be like, well, that's cool. But then um, how much do I have on my table? Can I fill in my fridge? You know, and, and that's, you know, and, and that's the same. You talk to Chinese, like, you know what? Like the, the movie, Maguire, you know what he says in the movie? He says, show me the money. Because ultimately, you know what? You can send me whatever you want dreams and so on it's like show me the money tangible and, and and that's the big gap between asian asian countries and and the west you know the west is emotionally driven you know it's netflix oh send me the dreams otherwise i'm i'm bored you know oh today i'm a, i'm a flower i'm no more a man i'm a flower and i might change tomorrow sorry <laughs> no, uh, no, it's a, it's, a, it's a good point though i mean the the west at this point they depend so much on appearance very superficial metrics but i don't know if you've noticed but recently a lot of that hasn't been working and you you can see them publicly kind of falling apart and uh, very uh you know behavior where you could see them just shedding this illusion of dignity they have this illusion of control that they have this panicking this stomping of feet this frustration uh over you know the, the fact that Russia is still there, and that China is working with Russia, that China wasn't swayed by the West's empty arguments and, and attempts to shame China uh, and create division between them and Russia. They understand what's going on and no amount of lies or illusions are going to sway them and they're going, they're going to continue. And we can see that the West has neglected every aspect of, of substance and now they don't have that to go back to. They're starting wars. They don't have the ability to sustain them. And this is because of years, if not decades, of rot that is that has seeped in because of poor, incompetent, corrupt leadership. Uh, so we'll just keep keep an eye on it, uh, Angelo. You and I will will uh, probably be back next week, Friday. I want to thank you, Angelo, for joining me this Friday evening. I want to thank everyone in the. The, who's tuning in right now. Thank you so much for taking time out of your day to join us. Please check the, the video description below to see where you can find and follow Angelo's work as well as my work. He's on Twitter. Uh, you were making YouTube videos. You have a YouTube channel as well. Uh, so people, please uh, find and follow Angelo on all, all of those platforms. And uh, until next time, bye for now.